Your buddy Vaughn doesn't have. Yeah. Oh. You told me to. Oh, I just said scratch it out because Yvonne didn't have it. <laughs> you should Let them know that Yvonne has dropped happen. the ball. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Evo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. I know Memorial Day and we're having a devotion. I know some of you are probably still asleep right now. But yeah, um, I wanted to go stay asleep. But everybody here wanted to have our devotion. So I thought, okay, let's do it. So we're here streaming live on Facebook as we do every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. You're more than welcome to join us. And if you're in the community, not today, you're probably asleep, but you're welcome to join us at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. And I know that this little advertisement is only good for one week, but we are having a spaghetti luncheon this coming Saturday. I'm, yes, June 1st at 11 a.m., so if you'd like to join us here at 5383 Martin Street, you're more than welcome. It's all free, and it'll be a giveaway to those that are in need of clothing and... Diapers, paper towels, toilet paper. Food, too? Is there no. going to be food? No well, food? the spaghetti lunch, but... Yeah, the spaghetti lunch, but um, also food, and there's an abundance of diapers and other items. So if you know of anyone that has a need, that will be this coming Saturday, June 1st, here at the church. After that, uh, there won't be spaghetti luncheon, so... Anyway, let's grab our Bibles, a cup of coffee, and sit down and open up His Word. Let's pray. Gracious Father, I thank You, Lord, for the simplicity that we find in Scriptures, Father. I think that sometimes we, we make it more difficult than what it is, Lord. We need to just simply read Your Word through the lens of the Holy Spirit and receive from Him Your truth, Lord, and apply it to our lives, Father. We need to not overthink it. We need not to underthink it, Lord. We need to not uh, bring any subjective ideas to it, Father, but objectively just taking your scripture literally, literally, Lord, and then applying it to our lives, Father. We do pray for our day and age, Father. There is such a challenge today. Many people are dropping away from church. They're no longer attending. Uh, church to them is doing something fun like playing soccer or baseball or picnic or family events and yet it's been proven statistically lord that those families uh, end up separating and falling apart lord in the end and it's those lord that are committed to church and serving and participating lord that stick together that are solid <clears throat> for the kingdom of god and i just pray for our for our country today and for all those families lord that lost loved ones a father who sacrificed their lives so that we could have the freedom and the peace and the security that we have today, Lord. And we thank you for the ultimate sacrifice, Lord, of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who ultimately gave his life freely and willingly, Lord, so that we could have peace and security in our life, eternal life, Lord, a home in heaven made by his grace and his love for us, Lord. And even while we were yet still sinners, he died for us. And so, Lord, I pray through the Holy Spirit that you bring revival to our land, Father, and get people back to church and back to the, the fundamental roots of Christianity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's turn our Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. And we'll continue on as Paul will be dealing with this whole uh, grace issue and law which is always a struggle. Even, even today, in, in knowing the Lord now for 30, well, 33 years or so, because it was 1987, so yeah, th 32 years now that I've known the Lord, I still struggle with, with this concept and principle of works and grace. Uh, it, I, not necessarily purposely, but it's embedded in me that there are times where I call out on the Lord, I said, Lord, don't you see what we're doing? And I realize that that has nothing to do with it. Our blessings come from God's grace towards us and not what we are doing, though we should be doing. And David himself in the Old Testament, and of course he's under the law, quite often said, Lord, look at the righteousness that is coming about through the work that he's doing. So we have to have that balance there. And I think the book of Galatians and the book of James go very well together. And if you read one, you should probably read the other. There are four small little books. There are two small little books with four chapters or so. And so you can read them pretty much in one sitting. And so it'll give you a good balance there. 
So Paul continues on, and I, I love this because I think he struggled too. It says, then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. Now, these were two close guys of his. They were friends. They were companions. They were co-laborers in the kingdom. And they were together for four, 14 years is a lot of time when you think <coughs> about it. It's probably the amount of time that me and Randy have known each other now for 14 years. Um, there's a lot invested in that relationship. They've been through... Uh, thick and thin in struggles. Uh, Barnabas had gone out with Paul on a mission trip, but then something happened to that relationship, which tells me that something can always happen in relationships. Uh, even after 14 years, uh, young Mark had, um, I guess he wasn't committed, uh, like so many Christians where they're just there they're not really producing, they're not helping. In fact, sometimes they get in the way you know, of what's going on. They, they hinder the, the ministry. And Paul recognized that in, in Mark and he didn't want to take him on a missions trip. And Barnabas uh, had more grace and mercy and said, well, he's young. Let, let, let's take some time with him. Let, let him come again and hopefully he'll, he'll mature, he'll grow through it. And then there's this big debate that happened between them. They got into a, a really big argument and finally they just split apart and one went one way and one went the other which one is correct uh, I always look at scripture this way the, the the more evidence on one side is probably the more correct uh, uh, view so when you look at Barnabas's life after that what do you see nothing you don't hear about him at all he just disappears um, probably goes and does the work. I'm not saying he doesn't. We don't know. But then when you look at Paul's life, what happens? He writes two-thirds of the New Testament. So <clears throat> I think Paul's view was probably more correct than, than Barnabas. Is that because God used Paul? You know, yeah. Is that because God went on to write about the great work of Paul? Yeah. Was, was Paul ever wrong? I'm sure he was. He confesses quite often. But I think that Paul's um, connection with God was so solid that when he made a decision like that, it was very solid. And so you can, you can probably agree with Paul and say Mark probably wasn't there yet. And in fact, later on, Paul will write about Mark and say now he's matured and now he's, he's a benefit to the church and he thanked God for him, but it took some time. And so just because someone is zealous, they just might not be mature yet. And you have to be careful in not using them immediately because that zealousness can all of a sudden just fade out. And then they end up causing more problems than anything. So there's a time of maturity and growth that has to take place in someone's life. But here he is 14 years later and he's still struggling with life situations. And he's struggling with the Galatian church trying to correct them on this uh, law and grace issue. He goes on and says, And I went up by revelation... So it was a divine appointment from God, instructed by the Holy Spirit, and communicated to them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Uh, so that same gospel, it hasn't changed. It's still the gospel of grace and not of law. It's the gospel that Jesus paid for it all. He was a substitutionary sacrifice in our place um, for the redemption of mankind. And that's the same gospel he preached, whether it was to the Gentiles or whether it was privately. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So Titus understood it. He knew that it wasn't circumcision that saved him. Circumcision came about, you remember, through uh, Abraham. <clears throat> On the eighth day, they were circumcised uh, the child. And it was a remembrance of what uh, God had promised to Abraham to make him a great nation. So it was a, a sealing of a covenant. But then came the New Testament, and it was no longer circumcision that sealed the covenant, but it was the gospel of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ. So no longer are we under the covenant of Abraham or the Davidic covenant or the Amidic covenant, Abraham or David or um, Adam's covenant, but we're now under Jesus's covenant and it's a covenant of grace. And thank God for that because we don't have to follow laws and rules and regulations uh, for our salvation. Um, so he goes on. 
as, as Titus here. Didn't feel like he needed to be circumcised. Uh, but this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Uh, I love that stealth thing. Jude uses the same words. They, they come in by stealth. And there are those that come in by stealth. They have, a, they have an agenda. And their agenda is to change uh, whatever philosophies in a, in a church. Um, we had a young man here that had an agenda. And he had the agenda from the very beginning. And it didn't come about until the end that you realize that he had an agenda. He was very charismatic. He was very friendly. Uh, he's talkative with everybody. Um, and he was able to uh, disperse and, dis and, and, and kind of spew out this, this false accusations to people enough that they believed him. And then <clears throat> the church was, was divided. I'm learning, I'm mean, still learning. Just like I'm learning to love, <clears throat> which is an ongoing process, I'm still learning to discern uh, people, uh, especially when they come in and they're very talkative, very friendly with people, and you just have to wonder, do they have an agenda, you know? Or are they humbled? These Jewish people came in and they wanted to disrupt the grace of God here. <clears throat> when we start looking at the church that we attend and start saying things like, they should be doing this, they should be doing that, they shouldn't be doing this and they shouldn't be doing that, we need to be careful because chances are we're now trying to put some rule or regulation on someone. We, have to need, we need to be careful about that, that we're not putting our works on someone else. <clears throat> yes, there are rules and regulations that we have to um, implement because of the safety, let's say, of the church. You know, like we do have rules about dogs being on our property because there was a situation where a dog nipped at somebody else and we don't want that to, to ever happen. And yet we have to understand that's not a, a law of salvation, but it's a law of protection. So <clears throat> he goes on. <laughs> and he says in verse 5, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. Uh, but on the contrary, uh, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcised had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcision was to Peter. Now he's talking about his calling to the Gentiles and Peter's to the Jews and how there are those who think there's something. You can always pick those out of a crowd, right? <laughs> they're very confident, they're very cocky and when they talk and they feel like they're something and you need them you know, in your ministry. Um, I would rather use someone that's not confident somebody that has no idea what they're doing and that just has to totally trust in God than someone that thinks they know exactly what they're doing. And usually, no, that's not true. I was going to say usually, usually, uh, usually that's a certain gender, but that's not true. I've seen it in, in both genders, that idea. Uh, there's just, again, something to say about humility. When we, when we humble ourselves, the Lord will lift us up and we have to walk that way. For he who worked uh, effectively in Peter uh, for the apostleship to the circumcised, that is the Jews, also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. And when Jesus, Cephas, who is Peter, and John seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace of, that was, or that has been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcision. So apparently the leadership at that time gave uh, Paul and Barnabas approval. Now I find that interesting. I mean, there's a couple of things there and principles that we have to understand, right? Paul was still submitted to some sort of leadership, right? Before he became a Christian, he was submitted to the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, right? He literally went to them and said, I need some letters. So he needed those letters uh, to give him the authority to go to Damascus and persecute Christians. So that tells you he was under authority there. And now that he's a Christian, he didn't say, no, I'm not under anyone's authority. I'm under the authority of Christ. I don't have to listen to anybody. I don't have to believe what, you know, you know what I'm saying? 
And, but no, he goes to the apostleships and said, hey, this is what's going on, blah, blah, blah. And they gave him, they actually gave him a letter also uh, so that churches uh, would receive him and the evidence of his salvation. Now, again, in, in Christianity, the authority is not the same authority as the world. And we have to understand that there's a, there's a difference there, though it's hard to determine it at times uh, because of those in authority don't don't uh, have that perspective probably or it's just a natural leadership skill that they have but the authority of the gentiles jesus said very clearly we're not to be like the gentiles lording over those under us and that's what the gentiles did you know you know i'm the authority here you either obey or you're out of here you know kind of attitude and and, and you better do exactly as i say and so forth no our authority is one that we follow christ's authority as leaders and if we're following Christ, then the things that we are doing, the things that we're living, uh, should be biblical. And so when we are asking others to follow us, not lead us, but to follow us, they are to know that they're biblical things that we're following. And so it makes it easier. But not everyone can be led, right? Because they don't want to be led. And you can only lead those who want to be led. Those that are understanding that... that uh, place and role in their life. And so the leaders should be following Christ and then Christ uh, will help those follow them. Now let me give you an example of this. <clears throat> when I was training my boys as they were younger, <clears throat> and I use the word training because of the scripture, you know, train up a child in the way he should go. So I use it in that context, it's not a military term, <clears throat> though you can use it in that context. But as I was training them up, <clears throat> I would give them certain guidelines that they had to live by, which were biblical guidelines. And those guidelines, I had to follow. And I made that clear to them that if they have guidelines, then I also have guidelines because I'm under God's authority. But I'm the head of this home. And as a head of this home, I'm leading the home. And you're not going to lead. You're going to follow. And you're going to follow the guidelines that I have to follow. And so it was like, a work together and not necessarily someone telling me these are the rules you have to follow, but he's not under any rules. So it makes a big difference when you follow someone that way compared to someone who just says, that's just the way it is. I know of, of pastors who, who literally <clears throat> will tell their elders, look, you either do this or you just get out because I got a line of guys that want to be elders, you know, so you have no choice and that's how they lead. Others who literally will tell their people, this is how I want you dressing. And if you're not able to dress like this, then forget it. You can't be in leadership because I want my leadership to be sharp. I want them to look good when they're up there. I want them to represent Christ in that way, you know. And if you can't do that, then just sit down. And so they lead that way, you know, which then brings a militant type of church, you know. Now, I'm not saying that my way of leading is perfect. By all means, it's probably not I'm still learning. But I don't like to put those on people. You you know, and the beginning I did, you know, hey, at least wear some slacks and some shoes, you know, and then some would come with a t-shirt and I wanted a button-up shirt. And so now it's like, whatever. You know, I'm just tired of, of trying to dictate that. It's like, it doesn't matter because Christ is, is being focused on. But there is a sense where you should dress somewhat appropriately. But even on Sunday morning, I realized as, as I brought in leadership and stuff, they wear their sandals. Well, they were up there and stuff, and it's like, oh, okay. But that's what we're learning, right? We're all learning those things and how we are to walk appropriately before the Lord. It's a struggle, but we're all learning that. So he goes on. They desire only <clears throat> that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. <clears throat> that's the instruction of, of, uh, of Peter and John and those to Paul. But when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came, came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles, but then they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Now, isn't that interesting? Uh, how Paul gives a little story, a, a tidbit of a scenario that took place in his life about the pillar Peter. You know, even Peter struggled, first of all. Peter 
uh, had his faults too. Again, after 14 years, and Peter probably a, a good five years, maybe six years, even more. You're talking 21 years, and Peter's still struggling with the law. He's a Jewish. It's embedded in them. You know, how did they get rid of it? And so Peter's like eating whatever he wants because he had the dream of everything's edible and he's eating with the Gentiles. But as soon as the Jews come in, he just stops. No, I'm more kosher. You know, hey, brothers, you know. And he was playing a hypocrite along with those people. And Paul confronted him on that because it's a biblical doctrine that, that, that he's dealing with here. It's an important one of law and grace. And so Paul felt that it was important. And now 14 years, he's got some invested time there with the apostles, with the churches. He has a little bit of authority. And so he felt he could go to Peter and correct Peter. And I think that we should be able to do that with each other if it is a doctrinal issue, right? Now, if you're coming to me and, and telling me I don't like the way you do this, and it's a matter of model and how I do something, that's different. Well, I appreciate that. What would you do? And I'd probably ask you, what would you do? And then I'd consider it, or I'd say, I tried that. I've had that many times. I've tried that already. Have you ever tried it? Yes, I tried that. It doesn't work. You know? But if you come to me and say, you know, your doctrine is off. You know, you're teaching more of this, uh, of works, than you are of grace. Then I would say, I have to look at this and see if that's true or not. I struggled. I remember struggling with, with uh, the description of being born again. I struggled with this for a while, literally. Because I felt like if I'm teaching them what it is to be born again and giving them such description, they'll actually mimic it in the flesh and it not be a divine thing. And I was worried about that because then now they're, they think they're saved, but they're really not saved because they're just, you know, implementing these things that I said, you know, like you got to be in church because that will be your desire. So then they get to church because I'm born again. And now they're, they're doing the things because to show they're born again. No, because you're born again, you do it. And that's, such a fine line, right, to say? Just saying those words differently like that. I'm doing this because I'm born again, or I'm born again, that's why I'm doing it. That's a big difference. And I think that this example clarifies that. I'm eating, not because I'm hungry, because I like eating. You ever do that? You're not hungry, but it's like, I just want an ice cream, and I want this, and I want that, and I'm not hungry at all. So now that's bad for you. But then someone who says, I'm hungry, then they go and eat. Isn't that a difference? Because they're hungry, they go and eat. And so because we're born again, we do those things that we're supposed to be doing. And so Paul confronts Peter here, and um, he does it lovingly, I, I believe. So look at what happens. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you, are, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as a Jew. Why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? <clears throat> who are who, We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So Martin Luther learned, Romans, the just shall live by faith. That was important in his life. He realized that it wasn't his works, but it was the faith in Christ that saved him. Paul's saying the same thing here. We are not justified. So there are three tenses there. There's justification, there's sanctification, then there's glorification. Glorification comes when we die. We leave these bodies and we go to heaven and we're glorified. Sanctification is our daily walk with the Lord and how we respond to the gospel. <clears throat> Most of us spend a lot of time there. Our justification is being justified by the blood of Jesus alone and not by works. We struggle with that. We don't spend a lot of time there, but we vi revisit that quite often. Because you ever ask yourself, am I really saved? <laughs> a lot of us ask ourselves that because we do something and then we think, am I really saved? Like if not doing that would save them. See, that's the wrong concept. You gotta get rid of that idea out of your mind. No, I'm saved because of the blood of Jesus. The question is, why aren't you walking the way Jesus wants you to walk? Lord, help me with that walk. <clears throat> so he confronts Peter about this uh, situation and then he, he clarifies what truly how we're saved. But if we, while we seek to be justified by 
Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners in Christ, therefore a minister of sin, certainly not. For if I build again those thing which, things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. I mean, Paul you know, lived this way, and then he destroyed it, and now he wants to go back to it. He goes, it didn't make any sense. Forget that. For I thought the law died to the law, that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let me read that again. I have been crucified with Christ. This flesh has been crucified with Christ. It's dead. It is no longer I who live. Don't allow the flesh to take control of your life, but Christ who lives in me. Allow him, through his word, live through you. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. And when the flesh tries to take over by faith, you control it in the name of Jesus, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Wow, that's a big thing right there. If somehow we could gain more favor by our works, then Christ died in vain. It's totally by grace that we are saved through faith. And if you haven't been saved and are born again, then I encourage you to become born again by simply asking the Lord Jesus into your heart and asking him to empower you through a divine source, not to perform works to give evidence of your salvation, but to bring salvation to your heart, which will naturally bring forth evidence of your salvation. And so I pray that you will surrender your life to Jesus completely. And I know some of you are saying, my life is surrendered, but you're not going to church. How could it be totally surrendered? Well, I don't need church. Well, that's a lie from the pit of hell. And I'm saying that very clearly because Hebrews 10 29 says it very clearly. Do not forsake the assembling of one another. That's a command, by the way, that Paul gives from the Lord. And the word assembly there doesn't mean just gathering together. It's gathering together in a building. That's the word assembly in the Greek is sanctuary. And that's where they gather together. And so that's a lie that's keeping you weak. You're weak in your faith. You're probably struggling with earthly things. You're probably struggling with your own salvation at times. You're probably struggling in so many areas and it all stems from the fact you're not in church. You're not under God's uh, <clears throat> leadership and you're not participating. You're doing what you wanna do. Your church is football. Your church is soccer. Your church is Mariloma. Your church is riding horses on a Sunday morning you know, and saying, look at God's beautiful. And you, and you mix it in with God as though somehow God's involved in that and he's not. He's not. Now, am I putting you under a law? No, because if you are saved, that desire will be there. But because you're not, it's not there. So I pray that you receive Jesus Christ into your heart. Let's pray. Father, I do pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, even while we're still yet sinners, Lord, that you died for us, Lord. And Lord, the natural fruit that comes from that, Lord, is righteousness. And righteousness is the way that we walk on this earth before you, the sanctification that we have in Christ Jesus, Lord. I pray that you open up your word to those that need it, Father. And they would simply say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender everything to you, Lord. Not just some things, but everything to you, Lord. Help me, Lord, to hear your word, to understand it, and to apply it to my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I hope that you prayed that prayer. And then I pray that God will make that found faith solid in you, and that it would move you to great things. God bless you. Thank you for watching. If you'd like us to pray for you, please post it uh, on this uh, link here. And we're going to pray right now uh, for all of you and for our community and for our church. Have a wonderful Memorial Day. And again, uh, our hearts go out to all the families that have lost someone.